inviting authors, three authors, to come and speak who are featured in this exhibit. Um, there are about 35 or 6 total, all from Dumbaston, who have written in Dumbaston, and we're very, very pleased and proud to uh, have such a talented um, citizenry here. Uh, I want to give credit especially to Gail Sorensen, who's sitting there in the back. This was her idea. And uh, she's the one that contacted you all, uh, got on your websites, found your biographies, kept you informed, and kept the town informed um, with, with lots of good publicity. Um, we've given a board, if you want to call those a board, uh, and a space for books. Uh, for each, some are larger, some are smaller, some have written many books, some have written one book. But um, it's just <laughs> astonishing the, um, the breadth and depth of topics. And um, I know you'll love hearing from these three uh, when they get up to speak to us. So today we have Dave Listing, Alex Wilson, and Margaret Wilson. Which Mar there's Margaret. <laughs> you can come up here if you want, Margaret. Um, the format is that uh, each one, and you can decide among you who wants to speak in what order, uh, we'll speak for about 10 minutes or so, maybe 15, more if you have, but we'll stick in an hour. And then if there are questions from the audience, we'd like to take them after all three have spoken, if that's possible. Um, and I'm sure you can say whatever you want. Um, Gail's given some guidelines, but we'd love to know a little bit about your book, a little bit about what you might be doing next, a little bit about the publishing process, or whatever. Um, has worked for you. So at this point, I will turn it over to you three. Do you have a choice? Who wants to speak first? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Mark Wilson. Okay. Yeah. 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 And thanks to Gail again. This is just really a tribute to community spirit. So um, my two books, um, I would say that I am an occasional writer compared to some of the people who are exhibited here, but another way of saying that is that the two books that I have written, um, they're sort of like dogs. They found me, I didn't find them, so um, and it's been sort of fun, but in getting ready for this conversation with you all, I was trying to figure out what the two books had in common, and both of the books, I think, fulfill two things that are important to me, and uh, the first book, Walks and Wellesley, which um, I was part of the Wellesley Conservation Council. I was living in this wonderful town outside of Boston. Pretty high powered, and sometimes I didn't quite feel like my rural roots fit into this very high powered place, so I found my spot on the Conservation Council and taking the kids for walks in the woods. And I just really felt it was an amazing uh, part of the culture of this town that they had spent so much money and effort and had so much foresight to set aside in this very, um, expensive real estate zone, a considerable amount of property, and set it aside as Parkland. And so it was really a pleasure to write this book. There were a lot of notes, there was sort of a mimeographed copy of things that they would hand out. And just as I was in transition from moving to Boston to Southern Vermont, we really got it underway and it became actually my, um, a project that I wrote for finishing Vermont College. It became my study. So it's, um, it, it really speaks to, to two ethics. One is that um, how you are in the world, and it also speaks to what are your ultimate concerns. And I think that that book really um, answers those two questions profoundly. It really says this is what was important to the town of Wales. It was putting aside all this wonderful open space. And the other thing is it just says a lot about the town. It's something, okay, what are your ultimate concerns, and where are you, and how are you in the world? So I guess I should leave it up to my own horn. Thank you. I'm sorry. I tend to fly a little radar. Um, so the fun thing about this was taking the old notes, and it was self-published. It was sent off to Michigan. And um, of course, the most glorious thing of part of writing a book is getting the proofs back. And you know, oh my god, I did it. And boom, this is exciting. <laughs> so um, but we printed 1,000 copies. It sold out. A few people got married because they bought these books independently and met each other. <laughs> <laughs> so I really feel good about this. <laughs> um, but, uh, I think one of the funniest things about this book was that um, the artist is Rosemary Ladd, who now has a very different 
career as a painter, and she was working at Green Mountain Spinnery when I was writing this book, and I knew that she was an artist because she illustrated their patterns. So I went to all the sanctuaries, and I took pictures, and I drew rough drafts of the maps, and she drew all the maps from my notes and the pictures. And when she went back down to do the final walk before she did the final illustration of the map, she was pretty blown away at really knowing these places without ever really having seen them. Mm -hmm. So that was Walks in Wellesley. The second book that found me was the Green Mountain Spinner Knitting Book. And um, I had a farm in Putney for about 10 years and raised sheep, and that was wonderful. And when I moved to Putney, it was just amazing to me that I really loved to knit. And, bought this farm and you had to have sheep to keep fields open. And that was very really exciting, but how ironic that four miles down the road was the Green Mountain Spinnery. And as time passed, so they started to create my yard planning and I am just forever grateful that they were there because they turned me, uh, they, they spoke to the artists and me and I had a wonderful career based on the fact that I had three sheep and three big bags of wool. <laughs> Four miles down the road with the Green Mountain Spinnery, and I got a book out of it. And actually, I have more books. My yard has been in more books than I've written, so but I didn't want to be too pretentious and bring those. So. <laughs> um, but anyway, so I was working for them doing their marketing. And that was great fun, and they were on a VPR or Vermont Public Television show. And one day the phone rang, and it was Kermit Hummel from the. Um, Countryman Press, and he said, gee, I really think you ought to write a book. And I had sort of been mentioning this to Claire and, and Libby and David, saying, you know, you've got all these patterns. You really should do a book. People are writing books about this. Why not? And so Claire looked at me, and she said, did you really want to write that book? And I went, sure, I'll write that book. So that was the second book they found me. <laughs> but again, it fits the criteria, which is dear to me, that um, it really speaks to the culture of this community. Um, it is a tribute to the fact that um, their vision for having small local business and <clears throat> uh, creating businesses for a lot of people who had sheep scattered all over the countryside up and down the East Coast and they had nowhere to, to turn this product into a value-added product. So in 1976, well, they started in 1981. And, uh, there are a lot of people out there right now who were at the forefront of what is now a huge industry in knitting because this company existed. So there are a lot of people who have nice cottage businesses and have, you know, discovered their own creativity and they've kept the land open and they've been good stewards of, of their own creativity and the landscape and um, given a lot of other people a, a lot of pleasure in having the yard. So, that's how this book found me. Um, it was actually, I will toot my horn just a little bit, I'm really happy that it was in the top 1500 of yeah. Amazon.com for three months. <laughs> 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 I don't think I was like, whoa, this is like my Andy Warhol 15 minutes. <laughs> no, it's really cool. Um, the other thing that I hear from people <clears throat> is how restful it is. Huh? Um, uh, people, this is a coffee table book, and it was, I really feel lucky that it came out when it came out, because now many books are um, mostly soft cover, and that's a shame. Uh, what I really like about this book, I'm, I'm really the editor, I wrote a few essays in here, but I oversaw the redrafting of all the patterns, other people knit the, um, you know, knit new models, and then I had to make sure that everything fit. And sending this off, Sending this off to Country and Press was terrifying because they just kept saying, I kept saying, well, you know, how's, how's the page going to look? Don't worry about it. Um, is the color going to be enough? Don't worry about it. Yeah. All I could do was make sure that we, and I'm going to show you a couple pictures, that we could um, provide them with the best possible raw materials. And that was quite costly because nowadays, when you get an advance for a book, they do not include money for photographs, as you well know. Mm -hmm. And so, if you want a book to look pretty, you have to step up to the plate and find the money. And it's not inexpensive to get beautiful pictures. So these beautiful pictures, I could tell you a story about each and every one of them, but I won't. But anyway, they're beautiful pictures. Um, nowadays, these are, as I said, they're, they're soft cover books. I just don't have the gravitas 
of sitting, you know, being more, the sense of being more permanent. Um, so, let's see if I can find one of the pictures. So anyway, I, I got, we took the pictures. Um, I sat here with this. This is the most glorious misery you can <laughs> Writing a knitting book or writing probably a cookbook might be the same thing. I, maybe your book is the same way. Um, <clears throat> but it's just all these numbers. And, and then uh, after hiding behind all these patterns, I had to write the final essay, which I had written in another form for a couple other publications, a couple other magazines. And um, it was terrible. It was a terrible... Uh, it was terrible but wonderful to understand that when you are uh, when you are passionately inter interested in something, and I think that every book, under every single book, there has to be, it takes so much work to make a good book, that you must have an enormous amount of love for your subject, um, or it's just going to show up, and why bother? So when I came to the last essay, I had to call a friend of mine, and I just said, I can't do this. I am just so afraid that it will not live up to the beauty of the pictures and the beauty of the patterns and, and how I feel about this organization. And she, um, and she was very kind to me. And she said, it's a black moment. And she said, you will get through it. And I did get through it. <laughs> and, um, when I, I, I got everything on disk, I worked with Joy Wallens, who did all the the little schematics. So this is the level of detail. All these little schematics here, and then there are all the pictures, and then there's all the text, and all these itsy bitsy numbers that have to add up. And um, I got in my car and I drove these two discs, two little discs, up to Country Red Press, and I handed them to Fred Lee. <laughs> so please take good care of my child. <laughs> it was so frightening, but it, it was beautiful. And it's just, I was proud of that. And I'm happy for the spinner because I think it really um, it puts them in a good light. So, end of story. Thank you very much. <laughs>
and around, I ended up working at that business to about 2005. But around 2001, I started writing the books I wanted to write. <coughs> I sold the ad agency, but kept working there for a while. And the first book I wrote um, is called The uh, Secret Life of Carrots. And it's an autobiography written by the God of Carrots. Uh, I, I wrote it, and uh, at the time I was working with Joey Morgan, who most of you know, Al's daughter, mm -hmm. who did these amazing illustrations. And we've updated them since then. This is a proposal for the book. And I got an agent for that in around 2003, and he submitted it. And everyone liked it and had no idea what to do with it, <laughs> which is something that I you know, understood, because I didn't know what to do with it anymore. So that I sort of put on the shelf, and I started writing a series of books that I wanted to write for a long time, in which historical characters come into my everyday life. So I wrote a lot of them, and I kept writing it. Then I did, as I say, what every writer in my generation has to do, which you drive across the country in a VW van and you have a nervous breakdown because it's like, that's what you do. <laughs> you know, you have to check all the boxes off. So it's hard to keep track of the schedule. I was still writing a historical book and I was writing two blogs, one about psychology and one I call Writing Sides, which is all the things writers do when they're not writing, which is drinking coffee, um, staring out windows, taking naps, looking for the perfect... Uh, the best one is about man bags, of all things, because if you're a woman, you spend, as far as I can tell, half your life looking for the right purse. If you're a guy who writes, you spend half your life trying to remember where you put your digital tape recorder, your cell phone, your keys, your glasses, your pad, your pad. So I tried using a man bag. It didn't work, but that's the kind of thing I wrote those essays about. <laughs> And it didn't work when our daughter looked at me and her, she sort of blinked when she saw me. I said, okay, I know it doesn't work. It's okay. <laughs> anyway, so I was doing all this writing. In the meantime, I think you know Wendy, my wife, and she was working at uh, uh, the library in, in Rockingham, Bellows Falls. And she got this letter, you know, you're always getting letters at a library from people like us who want to sell their books. And this uh, small company in Boston that specialized in nature, ecology, and spiritual books, uh, not only way to sell their books, but they were sort of looking for manuscripts. So I sort of ignored it the first time. And the second time I had this book, which as you can tell from the cover, is one of the most profound spiritual books that's ever been written, because <laughs> it was written by a vegetable. <coughs> and so I sort of sent it off to them and they loved it, which surprised me because they're very serious. They were, you know, kids I call them, meaning they were 30. And they, they did beautiful covers, and it's called Print on Demand, which means they were doing 500 copies at a time. But I decided, let's try it. Well, in the meantime, I had started working also with Dee Dee Cummings, who a lot of you know. And so we sort of worked on designing the book, more illustrations from Joey, and I knew, I kept on saying, well, the small publishing house would be like my Trojan horse. They do black and white books. And meanwhile, I got this. They do 500 at a time. Uh, they don't really do marketing, they kind of do. I came from a marketing background. So by the time I sent them the marketing plan, had cut the 70,000 word book to 40,000, gotten more illustrations from Joey, put the whole thing together, and said I'd help back the printing. To their credit, they said, well, this is a little above what we had in mind. So at that point, I had another unpublished book. And meanwhile, Dee had arranged for me to uh, speak at the Literary Festival, reading from this about-to-be-published book called The Carrot, which was no longer being published, and being introduced by Ken Burns, except for the fact that he's eaten a few vegetables, is it really a specialty? So, but they had this all together, and uh, they were very into it, and at some point, I think in July, I said, you know, it sort of doesn't make sense to have Ken introducing me to read a book about a carrot that's not going to be published. You know, I was about to become the first, I think, unpublished writer to read it, though, right? <laughs> <laughs> which I took sort of as a, you know, I was sort of proud of it. <laughs> anyway, I said, look, I've been working for 10 years on a book in which historical characters come into my life, and Ken, obviously, is one of the country's foremost historians. And so I said, why don't you just have us, we'll pull it off. We've been talking for 40 years, surely we can do it for half an hour. We'd never done it in public, we were both a little worried, because we'd always done it privately, so we are sort of outing ourselves. Shortly after that, I said, why don't we do the book you see up there? Uh, he's always wanted to call his 
I was going to write his autobiography. I was going to ghostwrite his autobiography called Waking the Dead. And my book I'd always called Real Time. So we put together a little limited edition of it. Which is nice. Meanwhile, which, which we brought out for the literary festival. And meanwhile, Dee Dee, two things happened. Dee Dee got me an agent in California, and she sold the book on depression. So now I had a limited edition version of a book that had never been published. I had a blog that was about to become a book that I hadn't written. I had other <laughs> books I haven't mentioned that I had manuscripts for. And that's sort of where I stand. I hope I haven't gone over 10 minutes. I have a book called uh, David's Inferno. It's going to be published by a company called Hatherley Press next spring. And it's nice because they're distributed by Random House, which is great. I have this agent in California who's just convinced the carrot book's going to happen. <laughs> She's a very good agent. She is the agent for Anna Dudeney, who writes the Lama Lama books around here. She's a very good agent. Dee Dee, uh, I have a book I started writing that I love, and I think I'm the only one that loves it. It's called Field Guide to Prescription Drugs. <laughs> because while writing the book about depression, there are a lot of books that list all these side effects. There's a lot of books that tell you what you can and can't do, and they don't tell us why. And so I started studying why, and you find out that like, well, half of the reason is because there are things called receptors. No one ever told me about receptors. So I love this book. It's done in a sort of Hunter S. Thompson, Hunter Thompson S. style. So again, on top of all this, I'm interested in a book that no one else is interested in. Plus, I have another book that I really like called The Power of Not Now, uh, which is sort of the future of spirituality. So, I was thinking, and then I'll stop. I was thinking that all the people here have something that they really care about, and it's great. They really care about it, so they have to figure out how to write. I have, I'm sorry, the other side. I love to write. I really care about writing. I have to find things I'm interested in. And I keep finding them, and that's my problem. <laughs> Um, so I'm going to tell a little story about uh, my sort of two different genres of books that I got involved with and sort of how one led to the other. First is this little Consumer Guide to Home Energy Savings that came out in 1991 originally, uh, actually 1990, and then a series of canoe guides or paddling guides that I've written and sort of how they're connected. So to explain that, let me back up and tell you how I came to Brattleboro, Dummerston area. I moved to Dummerston in 1980 to become executive director of a nonprofit group in Brattleboro. The, at the time, it was called the New England Solar Energy Association, sort of one of the early organizations promoting solar. It's now the Northeast Sustainable Energy Association and based in Greenfield. But I was director from 80 to 85, and uh, while I was there, I was doing quite a bit of writing. I started writing a monthly column for a publication called, it was New England Builder at the time, it's now the Journal of Light Construction. Um, it was a sort of a small circulation newspaper format publication for a while. The only good thing about it, I mean, the, the, it didn't make much money for the folks putting it out, they didn't have a very big circulation, but all the other editors of Building Trades magazines read it because it was the only, one of the only <coughs> Building Trades publications that had real information in it instead of what's often called advertorial, <laughs> where an advertiser and you know, some maker of bricks hire, you know, pays you, said, we'll, we'll buy an ad if you write an article about bricks <laughs> and we'll supply the article. Um, so <laughs> mix between advertising and, uh, and uh, journalism. Anyway, so I was writing a monthly column on energy for Journal of Light Construction and kind of enjoyed that. So when I was ready to leave the nonprofit world, I went out on my own, this was 1985, and started a little company, uh, sole proprietorship, doing writing. A mix of freelance writing for, oh, maybe a dozen magazines and uh, contract writing for uh, utility companies, state energy offices, a few private companies, but mostly related to energy, which had 
sort of become my area of expertise. Anyway, one of the projects I took on was for the Massachusetts Audubon Society. Uh, they had started writing this series of booklets on energy saving strategies. They're little uh, short booklets, one on you know, energy efficient lighting, which in, 19, in the 1980s wasn't uh, very energy efficient <laughs> compared to today's standards. But you know, various things on weatherizing homes. So they wanted some more of these written. They hired me to write a number, I forget how many I wrote, maybe five or six. And then an organization in Washington, D.C., the American Council for an Energy Efficient Economy, which is sort of at the forefront of promoting energy efficiency, said, we'd like to package these booklets into a book and sell it, you know, and reach out to the consumer audience. In the past, they had been mainly focused on weatherization professionals and sort of policy makers. So I did that. I started working on these, maybe there were 10 or 15 of these booklets. But as I got into it, I realized that, you know, really they were all written in a slightly different style. They had introductory material that didn't fit with each other. So I basically started over and wrote this book, The Consumer Guide to Home Energy Savings. Uh, it's now in its ninth edition, I think, that it gets updated every once in a while. Um, I think the last edition that came out was in 2007. Uh, but it's done very well. I think they've sold a, over a quarter million copies. Unfortunately, I'm not on a royalty. Yeah. Right now. <laughs> <laughs> I tried to renegotiate it. That part I can't. I tried, uh, but I, they initially hired me to do that one project for ten thousand bucks or something. And, uh, so now it's it's made the organization a lot of money, and that's great. It's a great organization, and you know, for myself, I didn't profit from it in on that level, but I did. Um, it really got my name out there and opened up all kinds of doors in other writing I did, and and helped when I launched a publication, Environmental Building News, uh, back in 1992. And we now have a company in Brattleboro, Building Green, with 20 employees that are providing information on the green building world. Uh, anyway, so how does this connect to paddling guides? <laughs> uh, a friend of mine who lived, here, lived in Brattleboro in the 80s, Gordon Hardy, I don't know if any of you might have remembered him, he worked for a magazine that was based here, Cross Country Skier magazine. And uh, when Cross Country Skier was sold, he left the area, it was sold I think to Rodale Press down in Pennsylvania, and he bounced around a few places but landed at the Appalachian Mountain Club, which is a, a non-profit organization promoting outdoor activities and uh, protection of nature and so forth. Actually it's the oldest conservation organization in the country. Uh, he ended up running their book program. And this book program had been languishing for a number of years. Uh, they had been maybe 10 or 15 years since they had had a new book. And he had seen this consumer guide and he said, you yeah, know, this is just the kind of book we want to write. If you hadn't just done this, we'd you know, love <laughs> to do something like that. But would you like to write a book for us? And, and I was kind of surprised. I didn't think of myself as a book writer, even though I had this little book come out, it was more a collection of well, chapters that was less intimidating. But he, Gordon sent me a list of ideas, he had like a three-page list of brainstorming ideas of <laughs> books they might like to do. And I looked through this and you know, there were none that really, that I felt I could do a good job with or that I knew enough about, most of them were outdoors related. Um, and um, none that really grabbed my attention. But for years I've been an avid paddler, a canoeist, and I've always in bookstores and outdoor stores looked for books on lake and pond canoeing. You know, I've done a little bit of whitewater, but I don't really like it. You know, I'm a chicken at heart. <laughs> uh, I like, you know, gentle paddling, you know, looking at birds and uh, vegetation and so forth. So I'd never seen a book like this, and so I suggested to Gordon a series of books on um, you know, lake and pond paddling in, in New England. 
And he thought that seemed like a good idea. I started doing some research, putting a proposal together. Uh, there wasn't really anything like that anywhere. I needed to figure out what to call this, and I did searching. And of course, we didn't have an internet then. It was more challenging to <laughs> dig into what existing books were in the press. But I came across this little book called Oregon's Quiet Waters. And I bought a copy of it, and it was kind of what I had in mind with uh, this series. So I kind of borrowed that term, quiet water. Mm -hmm. And first one was covering New Hampshire, Vermont. This came out in 92, I think. Um, I learned later that this photo they used, there's a fake fish. In the <laughs> <laughs> well, 30 seconds <laughs> to find out in the book called uh, The second one covered southern New England, Massachusetts, Connecticut, Rhode Island. This one, uh, another little secret, there's a photo here taken in Vermont <laughs> throughout time, but it's of our family, uh, and it was interesting. It was a beautiful autumn day, and they hired a photographer, and you know, had this canoe, and they made us go around and around, and he took photos, and you know, he broke off branches so that he had uh, you know, some foliage in the foreground. <laughs> <laughs> we did that for you once, I think. <laughs> yeah, right. And uh, we had a dog, uh, the Golden Retriever, uh, not the current Golden Retriever we have, but he kept having to whistle to get the dog to perk up. <laughs> anyway, so uh, that was um, that book. And so I wrote these two guides, and you know, covering New Hampshire, Vermont, then southern New England, and the next one was Maine. And Maine... You know, it was a bigger state, way bigger state, further away, and I, I realized I wanted a partner on that. I wanted a co-author. And I had done some writing for some magazine in New Hampshire, Hearth and Home or something like that, about wood stoves. And, um, and the editor there, you know, I was chatting with him, and he sounded interesting. He lived in, in I think, New Hampshire, and um, thought that would be a lot of fun. So he was, you know, we were set to start this book in a couple of months, and then I get a call from him one Friday that something came up, he's taking a different job, he can't do this book. So I was really bummed out. You know, I had a contract, I had to deliver a book. I think maybe I gave myself two years to do that one, but uh, uh, I didn't really know how I was going to do it. And I, was, I got together every Friday at um, $3 Dewey's, you now McNeil's Pub in Brattleboro, with John Hayes, a, a friend of mine who lived in Marlboro, Vermont. And uh, so I was over at beer, sort of commiserating, you know, disappointed, had this co-author drop out. And John said, well, I'll do it. And I said, oh? And, and he had joined me on a couple of my paddles of uh, the earlier books. You know, so I knew, and he's a great writer. And he's actually the one that brought me to Brattleboro when he was chairman of the board of the, of the New England Solar Energy Association. So we began a partnership and did the main guide together and then followed with a New York guide. And then John took on updating all four of those for second editions and now they're in third editions or some of them are in third editions. So that's been great. And even though he's moved to Oregon, <laughs> he's now dean of uh, uh, the humanities at Pacific University. He was dean at Marlborough College for many years and a chemistry professor before that. Anyway, so it's been great with him. Um, and we are currently, they're breathing down our back to uh, uh, get the next third edition out of the main guide. I think that's the next one. I, we keep trying to push them off, hold them off. <laughs> always a challenge. Anyway, so... Um, to wrap up, you know, I guess the interesting point in my kind of career trajectory, my, I always thought when I was growing up and in school that I was going to be an environmental biologist, a mm -hmm. uh, field ecologist or aquatic biologist or something like that. You know, and I was always as a kid out you know, with a microscope, pulling up pond water and seeing what's growing there. And, uh, and then I kind of got sidetracked into the whole renewable energy world and then building technology. And somewhere along the line I realized that, you know, my kind of life goal of 
making the world a better place from an environmental standpoint, I would be able to accomplish more by trying to change the building industry, which is arguably responsible for a pretty big chunk of the environmental impact we have. So I did that, but I've you know, but I still have this you know desire to be a naturalist, and you know that's what I've been able to do with these uh, quiet water paddling guides, because really as much as destination guides, you know how to get to a body of water and uh, you know where to put your boat in, where you can camp nearby, things like that. As much as that, they're natural history guides. You know where we write about what you're going to see. We talk about the wildlife we've seen there and otters and. We have little sections in there of uh, some of the key wildlife you might see. So those have been great and sort of allowing me to sort of nurture that uh, avocation even while my vocation, still as a writer, is much more technical stuff and, and uh, uh, you know, focused on the building industry. Anyway, so I think that's it. I mean, I could tell lots of stories of the great <laughs> trips we had. When I started these canoe guides, we had, this is my wife, Gerilyn, we had uh, two daughters, age two and five. And for about six years, I think all of our vacation time was spent on these extended paddling trips. We'd go off for a week, you know, to Squam Lake and camp on an island in the middle of the lake and up to northern Maine and do these extended week-long trips portaging from lake to lake. And, you know, our kids were pretty young. I mean, the first year, you know, Francis was still in diapers at night. And, um, you know, it was a, it was a challenge. But, I, you know, looking back on it, uh, you know, those, these books really gave us a, an excuse or a motivation to get outdoors and enjoy that time with our kids. And, and I, that was really the greatest gift. I mean, these have made a little bit of money. It's nice getting a royalty check twice a year. But uh, really the far greater benefit was sort of forcing us to get outside. And I know that we wouldn't have done nearly as much, I mean, not a hundredth as much as we did. You know, when I wrote this book was the year I was launching Environmental Building News in 92. And I had this contract, I, and I had one year to write this book. You can't really start researching a body of water till April, <laughs> except this year you'd, be, you'd do a little better, uh, when ice is out. And I had to have a manuscript in by October because they had it on the publishing schedule for the spring. Um, and I was launching this newsletter um, in the first half of the year and didn't start working on this until like mid-July. Mm -hmm. And you know, then I was spending these and I'd take three <coughs> weekends and I'd had this little Volkswagen Rabbit and a solo canoe, and I'd be driving everywhere. And uh, you know, it's partly about paddling, but it's mostly about driving. <laughs> and writing down mileages, you know, go 2.3 miles, turn right on something. You have to get those details right because it's telling people how to get there. Um, but you know, the, even with that hassle of all that driving I did, you know, every time when I you know would get the canoe out on a body of water, you know, no matter how stressful it was down on Long Island dealing with traffic or whatever, you know, it was always that, it's so refreshing to get out and uh, into, the, into the wild and enjoying that. We did the maps in these books on a computer, um, you know, I think really using a program called Aldous Freehand initially, where we would scan these uh, topographic maps and then trace over them in the program you know, using the mouse. It's pretty primitive, but the style worked out really well. We were able to simplify the topographic information showing where there's a hill, but not too much information so it didn't get cluttered. And they, AMC really liked that style and has used it for a bunch of other books now. Anyway, so that's, that's what I've got to say. One last thing, just because I happen to have some here. I've recently, among my various volunteer activities have been involved with the West River Trail uh, in Brattleboro and we just had some great brochures done. Dee Dee Cummings designed this and uh, so I've got a little stack of them. Please take one if you like. But it's a neat trail from the West River Marina. This lower section extends out to Rice Farm Road in, in Dummerston and it may at some point connect with the upper section which starts in uh, 
Londonderry and goes down into Townsend. I think there's about 16 or 18 miles of finished trail now. It's really quite nice. That's all on uh, public land, uh, Army Corps of Engineers land, and um, Jamaica State Park land. Anyway, so that's, that's that. And now we can take questions. <laughs> Factors of deductible. <laughs> 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 well, I've been able. To, I don't know if I've, I've done this legally. <laughs> whenever I buy camping gear, I have to deduct that. No problem. Canoes. <laughs> is that good? Yeah, the fact is, I think it's. Pretty <laughs> <laughs> Any questions? Yes. Right. Since, since you started writing these uh, quiet water books. Um, find over the years that there are fewer quiet waters? That's a great question and, and it, it's actually one of the quandaries I faced with these books. You know, do I really want to write about these really neat <laughs> places? Because that's going to bring more people to them and then they're going to be not as neat, not as, <laughs> not as quiet. And uh, you know, I really struggled with that. And you know, what I came to was if, if we can build uh, you know, momentum behind protecting places and keeping development off it, keeping development off these lakes, restricting motor access, uh, getting more people aware of just how beautiful they are will improve those efforts to protect them. And when the first book came out, kind of the, the crown jewel in Vermont is Green River Reservoir, if any of you have been up there. It's a beautiful place and, you know, when I first wrote about it, not that many people knew about it. Um, and you know it's no motors on it except electric motors and there's there was camping around the lake and just gorgeous spot i mean I, when i paddled up there the first time i saw a family of otters and there are loons that have nested there for years it was one of the first places that when loons sort of came back in vermont they were nesting where is it <clears throat> it's up in greensboro in northeast kingdom um, but anyway a lot of people were furious when that book came out because it uh it let the secret out of the bag. But, um, you know, the, out of that effort, there emerged uh, organization Friends of the Green River Reservoir that protected it. They got the Nature Conservancy to acquire it. They transferred it to the state. And now it's being managed as a state park, you know, with organized camping that's doing much less damage to the, uh, the shoreline. There's parking. The parking was horrendous initially. So, you know, I think it does some good. And I, I was active with efforts to successfully restrict uh, jet skiing and water skiing on Somerset Reservoir, which is a really great place in southern Vermont, uh, and uh, in, impose a speed limit of, I think, 10 or 15 miles an hour on the whole reservoir. So, you know, it is a challenge, you know, sort of, um, you know, how much I want to tell people about these <coughs> places, but they've stayed pretty nice. <coughs> For Margaret, yes, would you be willing to read a little from that essay you were scared to write? <laughs> oh, oh. Mm. just mm -hmm. pick her. <laughs> Why not? Um, actually, it was um, reprinted in this book, so I can read it from this book. <clears throat> My agent um, became a sort of an editor in her own right. She published three anthologies of knitting literature, stories about knitting. And um, I happen to have two stories in here, so I can actually, thank you for asking, <laughs> I can do that. Um, well, I can read you, um, I can read you an animal story in the month of March, or I can read you a story about Green Mountain Center. Well, specifically, you say it was the wrap-up of the book. It was, a wrap -up was so of the book. Um, daunting. I, I was just uh, okay. Here it how it came out. Yes, here it is. Okay, it's called Twenty Years and Still Growing. When I wrote the book, it was I started it in two thousand and two, the spring of two thousand and two, and the spinnery had just turned twenty years old. So, um, a step into the retail shop of the Green Mountain Spinnery in Putney, Vermont, and you were immediately struck by the sweet peaty aroma of fiber a vivacious array of color and texture, and the sense that you are in the middle of something wonderful. That sense is not mistaken. 
Step beyond the shop and you are surrounded by the stuff of making natural fiber yarns, bales of raw wool, carding and spinning machinery, scouring and finishing systems, and more. Spinning and knitting, fleece and fiber are the staple conversation among 14 full and part-time staff. In the late 1970s, the lack of local yarn made of natural fiber set Claire Wilson and Lily Mills, both weavers, on the path to opening a spinnery. There was a gas shortage, Libby recalls. Most mm -hmm. yarns were either imported or petroleum-based. Hmm, isn't that interesting? <laughs> um, Claire and Libby thought that making yarn locally from regional materials would conserve petroleum resources two ways. Minimal fuel would be used to import materials, and natural fibers would replace oil-based synthetics. At the same time, David Ritchie and Diana Wally, graduate students at the School for International Training in nearby Brattleboro, were in a study group with Claire examining how individual choices of every kind related to global issues. At the center of their discussion was E.F. Schumacher's Small is Beautiful, Economics as if People Matter. The book spoke directly to their concerns about the shift in Vermont's economy from agriculture to industry and tourism. David remembers, we wanted to work in ways that, both re that best reflected living in harmony with the earth, using local, resources <clears throat> using local resources to sustain a local economy. The idea of a spinnery suited them all, though none had ever run a business or worked with heavy machinery. Now, understand that Putney is home to several progressive educational startups, orchards, agriculture, and a thriving artisan community. In short, it's a place where Birkenstocks have always been in fashion. <laughs> the group envisioned a facility where New England shepherds could sell their fleece or have their fiber spun into yarn for value-added products. Their, goal, pardon me, their goals were all of a piece, to use natural fiber to make high-quality yarns in environmentally sound ways while supporting local agriculture. Okay, that's a pretty good start. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. As close as uh, the Green Mountain spinning, Spinnery is to Putney, it's actually in Dumbarton. In case oh, you didn't true. know. That's true. So we're all very proud of it. Right? <laughs> <laughs> I find that out when you get on the zoning board. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Yeah. 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 Is that the border, Cindy? Yes. The spinnery? Is that yeah. right on the border? Uh, well, the spinnery, so, the West Hill shop. Um, no kidding. Yeah, so the, they're all they're all in Dumberston. So the Putney Inn. Okay, so Dumberston Boat Launch is down there. So that is. Yes, Putney Inns and Putney. <laughs> 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 the irony of the spinnery is that it was a gas station at one point. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> it was a gas station. Yes. Wow. If you go in and really look around, you can see the messages. Oh, calendars on the wall. Pardon me? Old calendars on the wall? Only a sheet. Oh, okay. <laughs> Any other questions? Mm -hmm. no. Oh, Winnie. Uh, yes. Um, I was very interested in your talk about uh, these hiking trails and all this sort of thing, or the river <coughs> things that you did. Uh, when my husband and I first came to Vermont, uh, which was back in the 50s, uh, we ended up buying some land up in, in uh, Brookfield, Vermont, up on Bear Hill, uh, where there, uh, we had 60 acres of wild land and a very sort of dilapidated shack was up there that we have sort of turned into a rather rustic cabin. And my husband was a fly fisherman, and he had before we had the, the land up in, up in uh, Bear Hill, he had, we would come up occasionally and he would fish the Batten Hill, which was at that time very popular for black people. Uh, and a wonderful place. A few years later, we went back to the Batten Hill, and here were all these how can I describe them? Rubber things that very large people were floating down the back <laughs> with their beer cans and so forth. I mean, I couldn't believe it. That is one of the most beautiful rivers. Have any of you ever been to the Baton Kiln? Well, well, maybe not now anymore, but at that time it was usually a beautiful place. And see, I would usually sit by the 
the river and always wrote a book and had our dog and sometimes corrected papers because I was an English teacher also. And then I'd get up and walk down and Roy would be fishing and he got, well, this beer, beer thing. I, I just <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I hope I hope it's been corrected. Well, all right, fast forward now we're all up, up here in Vermont and my son uh, is a lawyer, but he's now living up in Brookfield, Vermont, and he is married to uh, Susan Shea, who is very active with the Green Mountain Club and, mm -hmm. and does their newsletter and so forth. So they're all concerned about the long trail and hiking and so forth. And, you know, there's all this push to go green and to solar energy and everything. Along with that comes these windmills these huge wind things. And you may have heard about the big controversy over, is it, I don't know which mountain, but anyway, great big turbines that are going to be set up. Governor Shumlin is very happy about them and all this sort of thing. Well, my son and my daughter-in-law are athletic, along with many people at the Green Mountain Club, because all this land they're going to cut the tops off mountains, especially the Lowell. I mean, well, I'm sure the expert on yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Can you just? Yeah, I'm glad to talk about that, and that's an issue that I'm, you know, I get kind of worked up about on the other side. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And I've actually been a member of the. Appalachian Trail Conference for a long time. They mm -hmm. sort of manage the Appalachian Trail, and they their board came out, um, you know, voting 19 to three, opposing uh, wind development in Maine because it was going to be visible from the Appalachian Trail two ridges over. And um, you know, so I wrote a letter to the editor and started a pretty interesting dialogue that happened in the pages of that magazine. My feeling is that um, we need energy, you know, unless we're willing to stop using energy and, or, you know, each of us have all of the energy we need produced on our own home with photovoltaics or something. And if we continue to be a consumptive to society, we need to take responsibility for producing it. And I'm on the board of the Nature Conservancy in Vermont, and we get into this debate as well, because there are some of these wind developments that are next to some nature conservancy preserves and some of the people on the board are pretty mm -hmm. worried about that. But, you know, as I argued at a board meeting, you know, we as Vermonters need to be concerned not just about black bear habitat, and that's often cited as the issue we need to keep this development out because of black bear habitat. We need to be concerned as Vermonters with polar bear survival, even though polar bears don't live in Vermont. You know, they're being affected by climate change, and wind energy is one of the ways to uh, you know, produce electricity with zero or almost zero carbon emissions associated with it. So, you know, I'm willing to give up, uh, you know, some, you know, of the, the, you know, pristine ridge tops for power, you know, and I actually find wind turbines attractive. Uh, the you know, ones maybe it's down where I can't, I never see the numbers. Searsburg. Searsburg. I, I, I agree with you. I like them there. Well, there are a few. The less low thing is a little different. And also, I wanted I want to ask you, maybe you're more of an expert on this, but um, is wind power really a huge Sort of source in Vermont. I mean, harvesting across this country. I can see. Yeah, Vermont. Vermont isn't a great state from a wind resource. That's what I'm you know, there's some sites that are okay, but they're not as good as the, you know, the high plains, the, you know, the upper Midwest. You know, Minnesota, <coughs> Dakotas, mm -hmm. Texas. You know, has really good wind and not as much in the way of mountains to cause turbulence. Um, offshore wind is also better. You know, the 
Nantucket Sound in a project that's being proposed there. Um, you know, nonetheless, the, the wind projects in Vermont, you know, the Searsburg project is, has been producing clean electricity for, I don't know, 15 years. I'm not sure when that project went up. Uh, you know, and I, I support those projects. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I argued that the Nature Conservancy, you know, if we're going to oppose, you know, one particular project mm -hmm. should work with the state and proactively say, you know, these areas we feel would be acceptable for wind turbines. And there, there have been studies that show, you know, that really map the wind resource very precisely. You know, so we know where that wind resource is pretty good. But, you know, as with all renewable energy sources, and, you know, Mike Merwicki is, I'm sure, aware of this in the legislature, you know, we're not going to have one answer that solves all of it. You know, we need to address it. You know, wind turbines play a part of it. Photovoltaics, solar electricity plays a part of it. Biomass plays a part in a state like Vermont that has a lot of uh, woody biomass that can be utilized. Mike? It's a good point that I don't think we're looking anymore for, for one, one big source. It's going to be a lot of different sources. And, and I don't like telephone poles. <laughs> yeah, the, reality, I don't either. the other reality is I would trade a windmill any day for a nuclear cooling oh, tower. Wow. Mm -hmm. And one of the, the points I made in my letter to the Appalachian Trail Conference magazine was that as a backpacker, I would much rather look at those wind turbines two ridges over, then not be able to see them because of smog from air pollution. Mm -hmm.